I um, I recently attended an ordination, and the recessional hymn at the ordination was Fosdick's God of Glory, I Will Spare You, my singing voice, but you know the lyrics of Fosdick's hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory, on thy people pour thy power, grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. I thought this is kind of an odd choice for a recessional hymn at an ordination, like not a dissonant choice, but not one that made a whole lot of intuitive sense to me either. And I thought it was peculiar because F Foster wrote the hymn in 1930 for the opening of Riverside Church. And the problem of these days to which he referred was the Great Depression, and then the, the hymn just uncannily anticipated fascism in Europe, and the darkness of World War II. But what is really striking to me about Fosdick's hymn, when we sing it in, in 2010, is what Fosdick assumed and meant by the pronoun we, or us. Who, who is the us of the hymn, and what things is that us, that we, being called to face? It seems to me that the singers of that hymn in 1930 were simultaneously and seamlessly the mainline Protestant establishment and the nation state so that they could in one moment say, grant us, Protestant America, courage for facing these big national problems. So 60 some years after Fosdick wrote that hymn, Randall Balmer, historian uh, at Columbia University, Randall Palmer wrote a series of articles for the Christian Century. The Century sent him back to those 12 great mainline churches that the Century had profiled 50 years before and asked Randy to sort of see what had happened to them. And some of them had really fallen on hard times. Some of them were in decline financially, numerically. Some of them seemed to have lost their way in terms of what their mission was, what their identity was. Randy Palmer collected those 12 profiles into a book, and when he published the book, he titled it Grant Us Courage. And what's striking to me about that is that Randy didn't mean grant us a seamless American mainline national powerful identity, the courage to face the problems of the nation. He meant grant us freaked out mainliners whose cultural and financial power is being eroded, grant us the courage to deal with like crumbling denominational infrastructures and mounting denominational bills. So, so Balmer's ironic use of this phrase from Fosdick, I think is a very helpful snapshot of how the mainline's position has changed since World War II. So here's the point. We can't and won't and shouldn't go back to some ostensibly glorious time where our Protestant identity was synonymous with the identity of the nation, such that we could speak with one we and name the national problems as, as our problems. But we also can't and shouldn't and won't stay in the place that Balmer named, where the biggest thing we worry about is like how to keep our denominational summer camps afloat and how our denominational pension funds are doing. It would be easy to stay in that second place. There are real questions about money, for example. My own beloved Flannery O'Connor Church is currently dipping into our rainy day replace the boiler when it breaks fund in order to like meet basic operating expenses and that can't continue. We can't keep doing that. But the questions that we ask from that place of anxiety are, I think, problematic ones. I, I've actually, over the last year when I've been at denominational meetings, have just started writing down the questions that come up. They include, how can our denomination become relevant? And if we're having trouble paying the bills, this is a real question that I've heard in meetings, why are we giving so much money to the food bank? I, I think that these are not the right questions. And I think that we ask these questions from a position of false powerlessness. I think it's easier to feel fearful and powerless than it is to be a disciple. It's true if we gathered up every progressive and moderate Baptist in the country and all the Episcopalians, 
the Southern Baptist Convention would still outnumber us. But, but really, we aren't powerless. We are working from the power of God, and we are also working from the power of institutions that haven't actually crumbled and died yet. It is, after all, God's church, and we can't kill it. I think this false powerlessness and its attendant hand-wringing is a serious abdication. I have, I'm reminded of what the theologian Sean Copeland has said about power. She has said, the primary theological virtue is power. It is the ability to get something done. So when we just wring our hands and abdicate our power and our agency as agents of God and God's power, that's a serious abdication. So let's just go back for a minute to Olive Chapel, circa 1950. What I find worth remembering about Olive Chapel is not that the pastor was buddy-buddy with the governor of North Carolina, although tellingly the century bent over backwards to point that out. Rather, what I find worth remembering about that church at that moment was that it was a church that was engaged fully in the total life of its community. And it's also worth noting that one of the specific ways Olive Chapel was engaged in the life of its community was through caring for the land. Then Pastor Garland Hendricks wrote in 1950, quote, the stewardship of God's earth is as much an obligation as other practices. I think that's a clue for us. Like one of our people, our mainline people, a mainline southern people, no less, was declaring 60 years ago that stewardship of God's earth was a central Christian practice. I have to say that on that score, by the measure of First John, in which our future is partially discernible by our present, we are in a whole lot of trouble, since on that score, our future involves getting swallowed up by the oil that we have summoned forth from under the sea. So maybe in our churches, we should stop worrying about the state of the main line and instead start walking to church and bring out the church fans and turn down the AC and stop shipping strawberries from halfway around the globe in December so that we can have chocolate covered strawberries at our Christmas parties. I realize that now I really do sound like an Episcopalian, um, but you can join me in the church fan thing. Think of it as the reverse Jimmy Carter cardigan move, right? The broader point here is not about environmentalism. The broader point is about discerning the needs of our communities and then involving ourselves wholly in the lives of those communities. Since different communities have different needs, I won't presume to give you your marching orders. In my community, it seems that immigration is a pressing need the deportation of people, the chatter about adopting a law like Arizona's law. In my community, white vans, unmarked white paddy wagons go through certain neighborhoods <clears throat> picking up people with dark skin. And a Latino friend of mine recently told me that the children in his community are now so scared of those white vans that they run from ice cream trucks that come through the neighborhood in the summer. So in my corner of the world, total involvement in the life of the community looks like taking some action around immigration and neighborliness. Maybe your community needs are different. Maybe you live in Raleigh and what your community needs is your church's attention to the resegregation of your public schools. Or maybe you live in Chicago and your community needs your church in the wake of the city aldermen's voting to allow a second Walmart in. Maybe your community needs your church's attention to fair labor practices and the movement for the living wage. And my roommate at this conference, I think, will kick me out of the hotel room tonight if I don't add that wherever you live, probably someone in your community needs you to have some conversations about who gets to get married.